Joe asked me to open his sermon today with a little illustration. But before I do that, I want to thank everybody for uh, those who come out to our 50th wedding anniversary celebration yesterday. Our boys and our nieces did this thing. And we knew, we had kind of had an idea that they were going to do it. It was supposed to be a surprise. But uh, the surprise was, was how many people were there. Uh, they had, uh, there's all kinds of people there from, from uh, their teachers that were in, they had in high school to uh, most of the church family here. And I know some of you couldn't come, and that's, that's just fine. I just want to tell you, you missed some great food <laughs> because we really had the, uh, some really good food. But uh, when uh, Ron and I were younger and I was teaching Sunday school, uh, we were blessed to be in a very uh, Bible-centered church. And uh, there was a guy there who wrote skits for puppets. We had puppets like once a month. And we had a little stage for a, pu a little puppet stage. And he wrote this skit that I thought was really funny. And so I was telling Pastor Joe about it. And he thought it would be good for me to, to tell you about it this morning. Uh, there was a stage, and there usually was four people behind it. And each one of them had a puppet on each hand. And in this uh, skit, there was a congregation like with like five puppets over here as a congregation. And then there was the pastor on this side. And they're building a new church, just kind of like what we did. And so the pastor says, uh, okay, now we're going to discuss what color of the carpet we're going to have. And somebody stands up back here and says, I want green. And no one says, I want red. And so there's a big argument starts. They're just arguing back and forth. And the pastor, he's trying to get a word in as way he can. They're just arguing. So what he just starts doing, he starts singing, blessed be the tie. And when, they start, when he starts singing that, they all stop and they start all start singing, blessed be the tie that binds us. And then he says, okay, uh, we'll drop that for now. We'll discuss that later. Says, what kind of uh, seating we're going to have? We're going to have chairs or we're going to have pews? And one guy in the back says, up, says I want pews. The other guy says, I want chairs. And then there's a big argument starts about that. And as soon as they get to arguing really good, he starts, blessed be the ties that binds again. And they all stop and they start singing, blessed be the ties. And then the next thing, he says, what kind of windows are we going to have? And this guy stands up and says, I just want plain windows. And the other guy says, I want stained glass. And then there's a big argument starts over here about that. And he's trying to get them to calm down and he can't. So he starts singing, blessed be the ties that binds us. And so they all stop. And uh, it went on like that for quite a while. But the moral is that, you know, uh, we as a family, we're all a family in, in the church. And eventually there is going to be problems that arise. How do we work those problems out? Do we argue or do we fight? Or is there a biblical principle to settle disagreements? And I think that's what Pastor Joe's sermon is about today. Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, and indeed that is what the sermon is about today. Uh, there's never a situation that we encounter. We Again, I have referenced many times with you guys, there's something called spiritual warfare. Uh, that is a constant, and it is a constant battle. What's, what's the ultimate battle? The ultimate battle is this. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And as long as there is an enemy of the human soul called the devil, and as long as there is a wonderful Savior and a wonderful God, there will constantly be a battle over people. You are that important to God. And is vitally important to the devil who has been called a liar and a murderer from the beginning to make a mess and to cause damage and to cause pain and hurt and if possible destruction in people's lives. And so it's always important to us to focus. It's not the disputes that come up that are the problem. It is the spiritual warfare, and it is the value of a human soul for whom Jesus Christ died and gave his life and has risen and is set at the right hand of the Father. With that in mind, I'd like to just mention Acts chapter 15, a few introductory things. We see part of the problem in Acts chapter 15 as we read it together. There were certain men that came from Judea 
And as I understand it, they went up towards Antioch and they were telling people, look, unless you are circumcised like a Jew is circumcised, you cannot be saved. Now, do you remember the words of Jesus Christ on the cross? One in particular, he said, it is finished. It is finished. There needs to be no other anything put on top of the fact that you have turned to Jesus and you recognize Jesus. I have sinned. There is no way that I can get to heaven. But you died to pay for my sin. And you on the cross said, say it with me, it is finished, sealed forever taken care of. That does not mean, however, that we go through life without friction because it's part of the spiritual battle. It's part of the battle for the soul. And these guys are saying, look, you got to add circumcision onto it. Now, I want to take you back. Why was circumcision, who was it given to? It was given in the Old Testament to Jews because they were going to be God's special people. And he's Ever since Abraham, there was this thing called circumcision, and every male on the eighth day would be circumcised, and that identified them particularly as Jews. And God gave Moses the Old Testament law. Now, the Jews would follow that law, and the one thing the law teaches us, according to the Apostle Paul, is, you know what? We are sinners. <laughs> we can't get to heaven. And Jesus come along and he said, you know what, if you so much as hate a person in your heart, you have committed murder. Now, I want to ask you, how many murderers are going to make it to heaven? Not on their own. Not without the shed blood of Jesus Christ who gave his life a ransom for many. By the way, why is it said ransom for many? Because there will be some who will not believe. Ah, uh, but for the person who places his faith, his or her faith in Jesus Christ, you know what? You have a home. You have a Savior. You have a God that loved you ever since you were the cutest thing that ever hit the planet. I mean, I have grandchildren right now, and they're the cutest thing that ever hit the planet. Until it's all throughout our life, and he has never stopped caring about any of us. And he wants to share his home with us, and he wants to share now our lives with us. So we see where this problem starts coming in because so many things are new. You know, when you've been doing certain things a certain way most of your life, it is really, really hard to change. And up to this point in time, the Mosaic Law and the light of the world was given to the Jews as a race, as a group of people. Well, one of the things that had happened is people had come in and said, well, now let's take the Law of Moses and let's make it harder. And in Jesus' day, he said, why have you taken Moses' law and you're laying a burden that nobody can possibly stand up under? It can't happen. It won't happen. And so they had taken something that was good originally and made it something that was horrible. And now you've got some folks from Jerusalem and they're going up and you know what? Some Gentiles are being saved. And they knew this because the first situation with Peter and Cornelius and he and his household and his friends coming to Jesus Christ has happened. And, and it was totally new for Peter. But God taught him a lesson. Well, God has cleansed. Don't you dare call it unclean. And God, by the Holy Spirit of God, came into the, into the Gentiles' lives. Now, a quick question for you. Do we have anybody that's completely Jewish here today? All right. What does that make all of you by nationality? Gentiles. Would any of us ever be able to hope for heaven outside of Jesus Christ? Well, I tell you what, there certainly is because the gospel was meant to go to the whole world. That's the beauty of the gospel. Jesus never would have said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature if he didn't intend every person to have the opportunity to be saved. So we have here a situation that has come up it's a situation that's based in a tradition, and it has become, at this point, a human tradition. And Paul comes along, and you will read in Galatians chapter 1, you read these words, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him, from Jesus, from the gospel, unto another gospel. And there is no such thing as another gospel. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. 
And so he is dealing with this situation with these Galatian people who I happen to believe were from that first missionary journey that we saw last week, that, that area through kind of central and southern Turkey, some of the churches like Lystra and those areas. And people have moved in and there was resistance to the gospel so much so that they killed Paul, but Paul kind of revived there <laughs> rather miraculously after he had been stoned to death, and he's continuing on with the gospel. So we meet him here, and they are taking this question to Jerusalem. Now, I, that opens up another topic. Is there a central place where all questions should be ironed out? And the answer is no. But are there people with whom questions should be ironed out? And the answer would be yes. Right? When questions arise, there are a group of people. In any institution, in any church, or wherever you happen to go, generally God places some people there and they, they tackle the tough questions that may happen to come up. All right? uh, I work at a mission in Fairmont. You know who doesn't take care of the tough questions that come up? Me. It's not something God gave me. The only reason I go to Fairmont is to pitch in and help out. But if there's a question that needs to be answered, God did not put me in charge of that. God put somebody else in charge of that, and I'm perfectly happy with that, because there's a bunch of questions I could do without. <laughs> but here, I get together with a group of guys from time to time, if the question comes up, boy, it's very, very rare. And I'm grateful for that. I like a church where I can just sort of relax a little bit and enjoy the people, and we can have a greenhouse where we can invite people and say, hey, we'd love you to come with us because we're looking at Jesus. We're looking at how great our Savior is. We are bowing our hearts before Jesus Christ together, and we are honoring his word as we look into it. And like the Old Testament priest of old, we are looking at the word of God and doing everything in our power to give you the sense of what God is saying there. Because that's how they did it in Nehemiah's day, and that's how we're doing it here. God's word is central. Jesus Christ is supreme. Well, as we look at this, we find, and I like how one person said, I like to share things I read from time to time. And, and, and this guy said, you know what they were doing, these, these Jewish Christians? They were sewing together again the veil that had been rent in the temple, in a manner of speaking. They were blocking this new and living way to God that Jesus had opened when he died on the cross. They were rebuilding the wall between Jews and Gentiles that Jesus tore down at the cross. They were putting a heavy Jewish yoke on Gentile shoulders and asking the church to move out of the sunlight into the shadows. They were saying a Gentile must first become a Jew before he could become a Christian. Now, anytime you hear that kind of recipe, you know you're in the wrong situation because the Bible says you need Jesus, Christ alone. He is salvation. You might remember Jesus' words to the disciples. When everybody seems to be leaving him, he asks his 12 disciples, will you also leave me? And bless his heart, one of the disciples said, Lord, who else are we going to? You alone have the words of eternal life. Now I'll tell you what, I'll stick with the person who has the words of eternal life, and that is Jesus Christ, who gave his life on the cross. Well, as we look then, point number one, we see that these people go about this and resolve this problem in a very good way. And that's why we study the Bible. It's an example. We take some principles from the Bible and we make it a part of our lives. How are they gonna fix this problem? Point one, attentively listen before speaking. And that's a, good, that's a good rule at any point in time. You know what, if there's a problem, the very first thing we should do is listen. Listen very carefully. Uh, in Acts chapter 15, Peter gives these people the chance to say something and to hear the matter before injecting a statement. He's, in Acts chapter 15, verses six through 11, the apostles, and the elders came together to consider this matter. For there had been much disputing. And Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know how that for a good while ago, God made a choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. 
And God, which knows the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Don't put a burden on people. Don't put an extra yoke on people. Don't make it harder for them to come to Jesus. Just let them come to Jesus who offers salvation. Pure and simple. That, my friends, is good news. Attentively listen before speaking. You know, the most of the more difficult ways there are to try to fix a problem is when people talk over you, when people don't stop talking. <laughs> and James had a word of wisdom for us right here that is just absolutely perfect. James chapter 1, verse 19 and 20 said, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. Number one, listen. Two, slow to speak. Why? Because it is so easy to put our feet in our mouths. Terribly easy. And number three, slow to wrath. Why? Because the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. It is a most uncomfortable feeling if I am angry or if for you, if you are angry. And you know why it's uncomfortable when you're angry? Because it is very hard to maintain some kind of self-control. Anger, at least, is an emotion that lets us understand, you know what, there's something wrong. There's something that's not fair. There's something that needs to be addressed here. But if you feel that emotion, you be very careful. Let every man be, what? Swift to hear, slow to, and slow to wrath. Slow to that outward display of anger. I'm very uncomfortable if I'm angry because I'm scared to death I'm going to say the wrong thing. And more than once in my life, I've put my foot in my mouth. It is so, you don't have to say amen. <laughs> Unless, of course, we are applying it to ourselves, and I understand. <laughs> but, you know. So important for us to take advantage of these situations. And I love how the disciples are handling this question as it comes to them. In verse 12, we read, Then, oh, this is beautiful. Then all the multitude get, what? Silence. Oh, organization. It's important when there's something that is important to be organized in approaching that topic. You know, I read in Corinthians where it is very important in the church service, and I'm so thankful for you folks because you recognize this, that it is impossible to communicate God's word if this place were in utter chaos. Paul said, I would rather speak five words that make sense than just thousands and thousands of words in a different language. I love studying the ancient Greek. I love studying the ancient Hebrew. I like understanding something about their wording and their culture and what it is about them, uh, what to communicate as best as possible from God's word. Oh, aren't you grateful that God gave us these Bibles? You know people gave their lives for what you can just put in your lap. It's a wonderful thing and a wonderful privilege that we have that we can read God's word in our own language and the Spanish people can read God's word in their own language and across the world today so many different people can read God's word in their own language. My goodness, if we all had to speak Latin, wouldn't that be a bad thing? Didn't work too well. But you know what? We can read God's word in our own language. All these people kept silence. There was a, it was organized. 
And they gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, who declared the miracles and the wonders that God wrought among the Gentiles by them. God is saying, listen to this. What Paul and Barnabas have to tell you is very important. When Jesus came on the scene, his miracles and the things that he did were a definite announcement from God. Listen to this. What this person has to say is very important. Now, I have 66 different books written by different men that the Holy Spirit of God breathed into. And I can tell you authoritatively, listen to this. Because God has spoken. Listen to the Word of God. We are encouraged to study the Word of God, which is why I love Bible studies, because they can help us get deeper into God's Word and give us a deeper understanding. Listen to this. I'm not telling you to listen so much to me, because I may get part of it right and part of it wrong, but be like a Berean who studies diligently, and you're looking into God's Word, and you can sit from God's Word, and you can say, yes, this is exactly what God says. And you know what our word for that is? Our word is actually, that's the truth. Truth in Greek was amen. That's why people say amen. It's not because they don't know what else to say. It's not because of tradition or that would be the wrong thing. But it's your way of saying, oh, that is, that is the truth, God. Thank you for sharing that truth with me. Now, in, in this church, if you ever felt like saying, oh, that's the truth, you go right ahead. Or if you felt like saying amen, Go right ahead and say that, because that means that's the truth. This is what God has to say. And as you are here worshiping God and thanking Him for what He has given in His Word, you're right on target. Now, I see another thing happening here also. Did you notice that there are a group of people that are entertaining this question of, should these new Christians be circumcised? There are a group of people here that are taking this. May I say to you that it is not up to one person to do everything. It's just a little principle here. This is an important question, and you know what? Several people are dealing with it. Initially, we have Peter, who explains what happened historically with Cornelius. And then, and that's in the past. And then we have uh, Paul and Barnabas, and they're talking about what's happening in the present with the Gentiles and how they're being saved. And then you're going to have James, and you know what he's going to do? He's going to tell them, okay, based upon this, this is how we're going to handle this in the future. You have all perspective, but no one person took every part of that. A group of people took part of that. No one person can do everything, because the Bible says that the church is a body. The church is composed of many different people who can contribute and can help and can build up each other and can edify each other, which is just something you really love to see. You love to see different things happening. As I look around church, I see different people who have done certain things around the church. The prayers of God's people building up each other because you know that we're in a spiritual war and you know that the people that we serve are important and that we care about them. And while we may, uh, I, I have one relationship uh, in which I do a great deal of joking, and that's intentional because it's kind of nice between the two of us just to, to joke around. But underneath it all, you know what I care about? I care about the fact that this person has the closest walk with Jesus that they possibly can. With somebody else, I probably will be a little bit more serious-minded because you know what? Not everybody likes to joke, and not everybody necessarily runs down that path, that's fine. I will be serious where I need to be serious. And for different people, we need to be like that. But it takes many different people in the body of Christ to do God's work. You have feet. Feet are wonderful. Feet get you from one place to the next. But also understand this. Your feet were not meant to do what your hands do. You can easily pick up the newspaper with your hands. I do not think it's going to work so well with your feet. They're meant to do different things. And so that's good. That is fine. I love people who are into administration. You know why? Because that's one thing I don't want to do. Not that particular branch. Like an administrator of a Christian school? No, thank you. A head of a Christian organization? No, thank you. There are some skill set that God gives certain people, that, and that's what they do. Uh, and most of you realize I, my mind often writes music. 
you probably picked up that I like playing piano a little bit. It's something God gave me, and I use that in the body, but where other people can chip in in different ways and sing and build you up that way, where other people can chip in in organization around here, and believe me, there are people that do that. I welcome it because it is such a blessing here at the church. There's just, remember, one person was not meant to do every single thing. Well, let's go to verse 13 in Acts chapter 15. And the people are listening here. They held their peace. James answered and he said, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon, or Peter, hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Isn't that great? Do you realize when you came to Jesus, God took you out of this world and has made a person to glorify his name? That can't be taken away from you. If you're ever feeling depressed, go back to that verse, will you? <laughs> when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he's selected you out of the world and you're a person that can glorify him, that can glorify his name. That's precious. Boy, it's precious what God has done for us. And then God did that for the Gentiles, but God did that for you when you believed. As we look at this then, and to this, verse 15, agree the words of the prophets. As it is written, after this I will return and build the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might what? What's our purpose for being here? What's the purpose for any church? Verse 17, that people will seek after the Lord. That's it. Why are we down here in this little corner across from Jenny Lynn Estates? It's so that people can seek after the Lord. And so that people that want to know more about God can. So we can dig deeper into the Bible. That the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who does these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is, that we trouble them not. Don't make life difficult for people who are trying to get to know God. <laughs> that's, that's the last thing we should do. Rather make it so that people can know God for themselves. There's nothing more blessed in the world than when you are talking to God and you know he can hear you. When you are reading in the Bible and the Holy Spirit is just bringing that thing into your life, and like, man, Lord, that's great. You're listening to God's voice. Don't trouble people, verse 19. My sentence is that we trouble them not, which from the Gentiles, these people are turning to God, but that we write unto them, abstain from the pollution of idols. I tell you what, there's so many idols in the world, and what does an idol do? It pollutes a person's life. It makes it harder for them to follow God, because once an idol comes in, you have a new God. Steer clear of the pollution of idols. Steer clear of fornication, which can be an idol in and of itself, from things strangled and from blood. He's writing to the Greek world, and that Greek world was very busy giving sacrifices to false gods. And he's saying, hey, look, you know, we're not down here to worship a false god. Steer clear of that stuff. Steer clear of the pagan stuff that's going on. Is there anything pagan that's going on in American culture right now? Steer clear of it. Is there anything that could mess up your life such that you won't really want to follow God, but you could just basically get to worship yourself? Steer clear of it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, and oh, don't forget this, love your neighbor like yourself. If you take care of yourself, take care of your neighbor. That's why I love the, love the, uh, our neighbors, because our neighbors are really good about caring. They go the extra mile. They're not here, so I can talk about them, right? <laughs> but I can't talk about them on video, so I won't. But I, I just appreciate people that, that demonstrate that care, that love for each other that we find modeled here in the scriptures. Oh, yes, abstain from the things that will tear you down. Moses of old time had in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Hmm. So 
such a wonderful thing to be a person that God has called out, called out by his name. By the way, uh, the word that we get for church, or we translate a church often, meaning assembly, ecclesia, kaleo, was the Greek, I'm calling you out. And, and ek was out. So God would call out of the world. Do you remember in the Bible when Jesus said this? He said, broad is the way that leads to what? Destruction. Destruction. It's like everybody's on a six-lane highway going to an eternity without Jesus Christ. And narrow is the way that leads to what? Eternal life. Life eternal. Who is that narrow way? Jesus said, I am the way. And, and that's the beauty. You can come to Jesus and he provides the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. Let me ask you this. As you listen to the news or anything, do you ever ask yourself, what's the truth? <laughs> I do, <laughs> all the time, because I hear people's opinions. Usually when I listen to the news, I hear a lot of opinion. And I ask myself, I hear an opinion, but what's the truth? Jesus came along and he said, you know what, where eternal life is concerned, where knowing God is concerned, we're knowing anything about life is concerned. I just want to let you know, I'm the truth. I will give you the truth. That's what I am. I'm truth. God cannot lie. Jesus says, I'm the way to heaven. And i got to tell you something. When you have given your life at Calvary and have been separated from God the Father and the veil of the temple has been written in two, and you have taken all sin upon yourself for every single person who ever is going to breathe, and all the guilt and all the pressure and all the agony of the cross, and you rise again from the dead, you have the right to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's why. That's why you can say that. So while many, many people are saying, well, you know, every way goes to heaven, i got to tell you something. Jesus says, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the way. But I tell you what, he's got my vote. And I'm like, Lord, would you have mercy on me? I'm a sinner. And boy, yes, I want you. <laughs> you are the way. Thank you for what you have done. And thank you that I can trust you. And thank you that where my sins are concerned, boy, they were paid in full at Calvary. Thank you for what you have done. And yes. I want you. That's one of the beautiful things about, about God. God says, I want you, but the question is, do you want me? <laughs> and if you do want me, turn to Jesus. Turn from your sins. Turn to Jesus, because I want you. Isn't that great that God wants us? What if there was a God out there, and, and in some religions it seems that way, that doesn't really care if you exist or not? That would be a most unfortunate situation. You know what? I need a God that actually cares about me. There's only one God like that that I know of. It's the one that came into the world and said, you know what? I so loved you. Oh, this God loves me. Wow. He loved me before I ever had a clue what his love was like. That's the God that I will side with. Well, getting back to our text here, let's see how this winds up. In verse 22... It pleased the apostles and the elders and the whole church to send chosen men of their company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this message. And the apostles and elders and brethren sent greetings to the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we heard that certain... You, I, I would kind of say certain folks came from us to you and troubled you with things you shouldn't have had to have listened to. But this is how they're saying it. Certain which went from us troubled you with words, subverting your souls. Whoa, park it, hang on. If indeed I were to try to put somebody, or anybody were to try to put you under something that's outside of Christ, what are they doing? They're making a slave of you. They are subverting your soul. We're talking about slavery. A to-do list that I can never, ever possibly fulfill. i got to tell you something. That's not the Jesus I read about. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I 
will give you rest. <clears throat> My Savior gives me rest. My Savior offers anyone rest. I'm not worried about what happens after I take my last breath. Because when I take my last breath, I have placed my faith in Jesus Christ and I have said I'm the sinner and you alone can save me and I'm giving you me. And I know you will take care of me. And I know when I take my last breath to be absent from this physical body will be to be present with you, Jesus. I rest in Jesus. I'm not worried about what happens to me one second after I die because I'll be with Jesus one second after I die. Now, I don't know what I'll say. You ever be, have you ever been speechless in your life? I, I think I will be in the presence of Jesus Christ. How do you meet this person who loved you that much? And that's probably okay. You know what? When you first held the baby and you loved the baby, it didn't know what to say either, at least not for the first month and a half. <laughs> and at some point in time, it was able to respond. You know what, I just, I, as I think about standing in the presence of Jesus Christ for the very first time and seeing him in faith, I talk to him every day. And it's as good as seeing him. But when faith is sight, that's going to be something, isn't it? It's going to be something. Occasionally, you have to forgive me, I end up going down a rabbit trail, but sometimes they're fun to go down. Well, for as much as some of us came up and they troubled you, subverting, making slaves out of you, you've got to be circumcised, you've got to keep our law. We gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Abstain from meats offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from fornication, which if you keep yourselves, you'll do well. Farewell. And when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, and they gathered the multitude together, and they delivered the epistle. And when they read it, they rejoiced for the consolation, for the comfort that it gave them. And Judas and Silas, being prophets, also themselves exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. And after they tarried their space, they were let go in peace for the brethren to the apostles. Notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. And Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of God with many others also. Oh, by the way, there is a principle here. This morning in this church, to the best of our ability as a church, we are teaching and preaching the Word of God. Why do we do what we do? Because we want to do what the Bible did. They were teaching and preaching the Word of God. Right now we're in Acts, but at 12.30 we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 1. At another time we're going to be in Genesis, but we are going to teach and preach by God's spirit and by God's mercy and hopefully and I pray all the time God would you give me what you need they don't need to hear from me they need to hear from your word they need to hear from the Bible and so I promise you that as a as a as a person among you that we will teach and preach the word of God and some days after Paul said to Barnabas verse 36 let's go again and visit our brethren in every city where we've preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark, but Paul thought it not good to take him with them, who departed from them, from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp that they departed asunder one from another, and Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas, being recommended by the brethren to the grace of God, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. It's kind of an interesting thing. Barnabas seemed to have a ministry all his own. His was a ministry of, of uh, somewhat comfort, if you will, somewhat mentorship, somewhat taking a person under wing, and that's fine. Now, Acts is going to track where does the gospel go, but Timothy 
uh, not Timothy, sorry, John Mark is going to be useful. Why? Because one of the books we read happens to be the Gospel of Mark. He wrote it. But also John Mark is going to be useful because Paul in the book of Timothy is going to say, hey, would you bring John Mark? He could be very helpful to me at this point in time. What happened between the time when John Mark said, there's too much work up there, I really don't want to get involved with it, I'm going home, and yes, I will go way out of my way to help. I'd like to mention to you, I think that person was Barnabas. We need people like that in the body of Christ. Somebody that cares, somebody that will work individually with people and, and make a difference in their lives. But notice that they had a sharp contention themselves. All this to say... In your life, with spiritual battles, first off, there will be an enemy who will try to divide people. Let's understand that. We are in a spiritual battle. You might also think of the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12. As much as lieth within you, live peaceably with all men. All this to say, it may be quite possible that you live near someone that will not be peaceful. That is not necessarily your fault. What do you do? You pray for those people. You pray that God might break through it. But, you know, honestly, it takes two people to have a relationship, and there be some people, that's, let's face it, it's just, it's not going to happen without God. All this to say, God can do anything. If He can speak and the worlds are made, He can do anything. So I have no trouble praying. When I pray, I believe God can do anything. <laughs> I don't pray and think, God, you, this one's too much. God is able to do anything. I just don't know God's will. That's all. But I will pray knowing that God can do anything. I used to sing that as a kid. Anybody ever sing when they were young? God can do anything, anything, anything. I come from a very old era, the 1960s. And that's what we sang in our little Sunday school classes. God can do anything. But I also know we all have a will, don't we? We have this little will in here. But thank God that he does answer prayer. You know, we got one guy in the church it took 20 years for him to ever come to Jesus. And it's because two elderly ladies in the church, you know what they did? They prayed. They said, Lord, that person needs you. And they didn't quit praying for 20 years. You know what happened to that guy? Well, he'd become a pastor. And he worked in a mission. And he got to see all sorts of people saved. And you know why? Two ladies who never gave up. Right. And that guy sitting on the back row to my left. God can do anything. And God can take these situations that we encounter and he can do this. But again, these things sort of happen. Now I gave you something. Uh, I took uh, Bless Be the, top, the Tie That Binds and uh, somewhat, you'll have to forgive me, but I do have an odd, odd little glitch of the humor. It's part of my eccentricity. I said, Bless Be the Bind That Ties. <laughs> Every once in a while we run into problems that tie us up. And so this was just something I ran into. I don't want to make it the heart of my message, but there's some good advice there if you want to look at it. Part of that advice goes a little bit like this. Uh, it is a good idea to set a time and a place for a discussion. All this to say, is it a good idea to start discussing something when two parties are raving angry? No. And therefore, it is a good if you want to go with James and say, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, there's a better time to talk about things. Is it a good idea to get your cell phone out and start texting your grievances to somebody when you are angry? No. If there is ever a moment in your life where there is a component of emotion in your lives, if you are feeling anger and you're behind this thing, you're not really talking to a human being. You don't know how they feel. You can't read body language. You can't see their eyes. You can't see if your words are hurting or slicing. Don't go here. Don't. <laughs> and don't go here either. Well, let me tell you, I could give you a piece of my mind. Like, we can get it back again. Don't do that. A rage of time in a day to talk about something and, and recognize, you know what? We are only human. There's only one God that knows everything. We see through a glass darkly, which is Paul's way of saying we don't have every single fact. But someday we will. But if we don't have every single fact right now, we better be very careful how we approach people. 
Point two, define the problem. What was the problem that the folks had? They had a problem over circumcision. That was the problem. Should they be circumcised or should they not? They talked about it a while and recognized God was saving these Gentiles. Talk about how each contributes to the problem. I kind of like that. Very often, you know, you take a marriage situation. There may be something that I do. Well, let, me, let me go here. Um, well, no, let me not go here. I had to think that one through for a second. <laughs> Is that would insinuate that maybe there's something Michelle does, all right? But if, as we work together, generally speaking, it's very easy for me to say there are things that I do that do not help a relationship. I'll just take responsibility for me. In whatever situation you're in, take responsibility for your part. Even as Christian teachers taught that way for years, they said, ask yourself, have I been a part of the problem? As a Christian administrator, have I been a part of the problem? Have I, have I heard? Have I heard everything? Have I been quick to hear? Have I been slow to speak? And that volatile emotion called anger, yes, there's a problem that needs fixing, but we've got to be careful with that, that emotional, because, boy, we say things we, we regret. Am I, am I slow to wrath? Well, talk about how each of you contribute to the problem. List past attempts to resolve an issue that, that didn't work. Brainstorm a new way to resolve the conflict. Now here they are, they're doing their history. They're saying, look, God has, God has moved in among these Gentiles, and we are seeing not only that he's moved in, but there's some supernatural activity here, like that that we saw with Jesus, like that that we've seen with the apostles. It says God is doing something with these people uniquely here. And so they're talking about this brand new situation. And in our own lives as we encounter stuff, uh, there's never a situation that comes up that we define that problem and we, okay, that didn't work, so let's move on to something else. And, and you brainstorm, because why? Even a bad idea might be part of a good idea. It might lead to a better solution. So you just sort of put some things out there. Discuss and evaluate the solutions and Agree to try one. I think of a, I think of a situation uh, in school. I, again, part of my background is education. And in that, there was a teacher that said, uh, at this moment in time, something's not working for us. Boy, am I glad she said it that way. What can we do to fix this situation? Boy, I like she said it that way, too. I never forgot that. That was from the 1980s that I heard that and it's still stuck in the back of my brain today. What, and, and it assumes it's not, it's your fault. Oh, don't go there. <laughs> you know, don't, don't go there. Deep down, you might think it is, but <laughs> don't, don't go there. Because, because you have to work together to fix a problem. Agree how each individual can work towards a solution. And then finally, set up another meeting to talk about progress. And honestly, some give and take, you know. Hey, this is great. Be quick to thank people. Be quick to state, I appreciate how this is going. Thanks for your part. Be quick to understand. I like how one list says, allow yourself a little humor. Allow yourself a little bit of a chance to laugh at yourself. You know, sometimes uh, uh, the right kind of humor in a situation can keep things from being so terribly, terribly tense. All right? And I mentioned the right kind of humor because, you know, the wrong kind of humor won't help anything. But sometimes we take ourselves too seriously. And may I say, this was just an external list. There's nothing about this list that really works unless you say, God, there's a problem here. I don't know how to fix it. We need your wisdom. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Because why? Because my perspective, our perspectives are limited, but God knows everything. Lord, would you have mercy? I really want to see you work. I really want to see, I really want to see you be honored and glorified in every situation. Well, let me say, as we have been this morning in Acts chapter 15, we found out they did something, and you know what? It worked. <laughs> it worked well. They did things God's way. And I gotta tell you, there's no other way. They were all Christians that had these problems. And it worked, <laughs> okay? And if it works for those folks, the same God and the same Spirit of God can lead us step by step and day by day.
So quick review with you, just a practical thing. Should you ever get up your cell phone and start texting someone the first thing that goes through your mind? Ixnay. No. Why? Because I could have emotions attached to that. I can't see another person. We need to ask ourselves, are people valuable enough for us to take our time and just talk? Do some coffee. Do something. Back in the day, I don't know about you, but you know, do you remember the letter writing days? Because we didn't have things like text and cell phone and all that stuff. I remember them in the 1970s. And I'd write letters to friends. We moved from Seattle to Oregon. And I always thought to myself, and, and I'd, I'd even make phone calls occasionally because I thought, you know what? While most people are trying to save, day, uh, save, save their dimes on phone calls and long distance fees, do you remember those? <laughs> I always thought to myself, are people important enough? Do they value? Do I value them enough to pick up a phone for a long distance call? Now, I know we're talking about what happened in the 70s and early 80s, but <laughs> do I value them? Make sure people know that. And it was valuable enough for these people in Acts to talk about something very important, and people's lives and people's eternities should be valuable enough to us to take our time as well. So I think that's our challenge today from God's Word. Let's bow with a moment of prayer. Father, as we bow before you and we see that these people were able to work out their problems, I pray that you might be gracious to us because, boy, we, we encounter things too. There's nothing new under the sun. If they had problems, we'll have problems. They had an enemy called the devil and we have the same enemy, but God, we have the same person. We have you. First, Lord, there would be no hope for any of us unless you had said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. We'd have no hope for us unless for the joy that was before you, you would endure that cross and despise the shame and be set down at the right hand of God. So, Father, thank you for salvation. Thank you for Jesus. I pray for a time of invitation, Lord, that we might truly be clear with you. In Jesus' name, amen. With your head still bowed and your eyes still closed, if I may go down this route with you for a second. If you've never actually truly asked Jesus to be your Savior, some key things that you want to know, and one of those key things is all have sinned. I have sinned. You have sinned. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The second part is, is this, is that Jesus did die to pay for all of our sins. You know, just before he died, about a week before he told his disciples, I'm going to go up to Jerusalem and I'm going to be crucified and, I, and in three days I'm going to rise from the dead. You know what happened three days later? Verifying every word Jesus ever prophesied, he came back to life and has been alive ever since at God the Father's right hand. And the Bible says to us, if we will confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. The Bible says, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It is my hope that each person here has indeed called on the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you ever have a question about that, please see me. If you're not sure that you have, saved, have asked Jesus to save you, please come and see me after the service. I don't bite. Michelle can promise you that. I'm just Joe. And I just love to share Jesus with folks. And make sure you know for sure that you have Jesus as your Savior. Because just hating someone is enough to keep us out of God's presence forever. But Jesus came to take care of all that. Our part is to receive Jesus for ourselves. The second part of our sermon goes this way. And it's what most of it was dedicated to, is that we can fix the problems that come our way with God, one step at a time. And I hope this is a blessing. I tell you, I see the list, and you know what? I'm like, oh boy, I wish I did better at this. But I think that's everybody in the room. You just keep taking another step. You just keep loving people. You just keep loving God. And <laughs> you let Him love you in return. Don't let the evil in the world and don't let the problems in the world knock you out of the race. You're too important. You're God's kid when you've placed your faith in Jesus. And people are worth, are worth the time and effort. So, and there will be cases, like Paul and Barnabas, there will be cases, as much as life within you, live peaceably with all men. Some people don't want to live peaceably. We understand that. God understands it. The first person Jesus came to after he was <clears throat> risen again from the dead were not the Pharisees and not the chief priests. <laughs> so, remember, 
You have a Savior that loves you and will enable you. He came to his disciples. And God wants to take care of you. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your word. I pray what you want to emphasize will be what people take home with them. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Looking unto looking Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith.